on a second book. <laughs> um, the moment when it clicked for you, I'm sure you were in diapers. What, what, Gabrielle? <laughs> education how important it was really clicked was again it started at home really uh, my family my parents they were really they stress and they say how important it is to learn to continue to learn not just in school but in everyday life continuing to have your brain stimulated day by day and um, my dad he he always says you know think of your grades as money like what you get, you know, A's, $100, or however much it is, and you kind of go from there and you continue to try and reach those $100 day by day. And um, so for my parents, I just continued to learn that you have to continue to stimulate your brain and learning, when you learn new things and when you have new things in your brain, it can, you don't know when you'll be able to use it, but you have it, so when you need it, you have it to use. Yeah! That's it right there! Perfect. When you need it, you have it to use. Mm. I tell you, we can all learn from the young. Derek, how are you? I don't know how you follow that up, right? <laughs> when did it click for you? Because, you know, I read your bio, but I, but I know your story. I mean, uh, and we'll get into that. But when did, you, when did it click for you that this was the way out? Well, once I got abandoned in an empty apartment at 11. Pull see? the microphone up so we can hear you. Uh, once I got abandoned in an empty apartment at 11, uh, my mom and my dad had left the year before. I went and found a job at the grocery store, Win Dixie. And, you know, you carry people's bags for a dime or 10 cents in the 80s. I got my first $3. I went across the Kentucky Fried Chicken and thought about getting a two-piece biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> I realized that if she didn't come home, I might starve again. So uh, I went to grab some bread and bologna, went back to that empty apartment, and slept there for the next weekend. And then I didn't see my mother for the next 28 years. And <clears throat> but I wound up having to sleep house to house at 12 and 13. At 14, I stayed with a high school girlfriend. She got pregnant. At 15, she gets in trouble, so now I am 15 years old with a child in an apartment, sleeping house to house. I worked at a candy store in a week, paper route on weekends. When I turned uh, 18, I had a 3.7 GPA class president in full custody of myself. I slept in a book bag and I slept on my social studies book and it hurt my neck. <laughs> and, I, and I took it out and I actually read it. Yeah. How about that? Time, you know, situations. I, I got a 93 in that class and she put me in the front of the class. And after that, you know, I found out that she gave me the potential. And I, I say success is not defined by money, it's by your character. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Danella, you're a Washingtonian. When did it click for you that education would save your life or make your life what you dreamed it should be? For me, education completely changed my life and was, was my way to make a change. So I'm from Southeast DC, single parent, teen mom of two, and life was very difficult. But as I went through school, I got to see that education could offer me a way out, a way to get a job, a scholarship. So for me, when I was in high school, it was do or die for me to change my life because it all depended on me at that time. I knew my best shot was education. So I worked so hard and I knew that if I got good grades and I was in various programs, I had a chance at a scholarship. And if I had a chance at a scholarship, I could live in school for four years and then figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, I worked so hard. I got into NYU and paid for it myself. 
because I did not have any other options. So for me, when you ask that question, it really hits home because education 100% changed my life because it gave me options. And again, I lived four years for free until I could get a job and figure it out. Excellent. <laughs> Hezekiah? First of all, I want to thank uh, WHUR and all the folks that have uh, put this event together. I uh, represent uh, an organization that focuses on leadership, and so I know y'all have a great leader at this church. I've seen him on YouTube. I've seen him on FBC, Glen Arden. Pastor John K. Jenkins and his lovely wife, I want to thank you for having the vision and the stewardship to honor Dr. King in your church today and all of the members here. Uh, this is holy ground. Now, see, I'm not a preacher, but I have preacher tendencies. And... <laughs> okay, two minutes for this. It's just an introduction, Hezekiah. <laughs> two minutes. And when I walked in this church, I thought, ain't nobody else going to speak. I'm going to have to preach up in here. This... <laughs> okay, I, I got to get in order. I, I, let me get in order. When I was seven years old, uh, I uh, had a moment where I had a chance to look at my life. I was in the third grade, and my third grade teacher told me that I was the worst student she ever met in her life. I got straight Fs on my report card, and uh, my life situation had to change. Grew up in poverty when I was two years old. My father left the house. We were poor. We were homeless. I lived in a very impoverished city. Uh, my education was a reflection of my community. That's how it is oftentimes in large population cities where you have minorities, unfortunately. So my grandparents decided that I needed to be corrected and sent me down to Charlotte, North Carolina. Big difference. Oh, don't clap for that. <laughs> there are no bodegas in Charlotte, North Carolina. No corner stores. I, I, it was very difficult. It was very difficult. You had to walk two miles to the gas station to get candy. It's very difficult. My grandfather is a preacher in the Amy Zion Church, very prominent preacher, general officer, and he says to me one day, I want you to film me as I'm preaching. I want to make sure that my intonation is correct. I said, no problem, Doc. Your information, I'll get it right for you. Easiest assignment I ever did in my life. I'm sorry to say this. I normally would go to church, go to sleep, wake up, and go home. This required me to press record on the VCR before I went to sleep and press stop when I woke up. Old lady comes up to me one Sunday as I'm putting the tripod away. She said, son, how much does a tape cost? My grandfather never gave me instructions to sell a tape, but I had to be a leader. I said, $15. <laughs> you had that mindset, yes. This crazy lady went in her pocketbook and gave me $15. A few weeks later, Really quickly to sum this up, a few weeks later, the big moment came in my life. I was putting a tripod away, and a younger lady came up to me and said, I like the way you use that camera. I have a wedding coming up, uh, and I need you to film it for me. I said, man, I'm a stationary guy. I come to church, I press record, I go to sleep, I wake up. She says, I'll pay you $3,500. I said, what time you want grandma to drop me off? My good friend Delator McNeil says, knowledge is not power. That's what he says. He says, applied knowledge is power. Yeah. Each day of your life, you apply new knowledge. And every day since then, I've been learning how to better myself and better those around me. All right, Gwen, you got to follow that. <laughs> Good morning, church. Everybody's giving me these looks like, whoa, how do you follow all that, right? <laughs> so, um, so I do want to start by saying thank you for the invitation to be here today. And I'm, I'm having a fabulous time. I've just been worshiping, 
and it has been wonderful. So, so I'm, I'm just truly blessed and, and just th appreciate the opportunity to be here and also to be on this panel with really a diverse group of people. But, uh, you know, I'm telling you, it's just sewing into me. So, so thank you. But, um, but education has actually always been important in my life. Um, I'm from a family of 10, so I have seven siblings. My dad was a mechanic, an aircraft mechanic in the Air Force. My mom was a homemaker and a sewing machine operator with an eighth grade education. So for my family and my parents, they always really pushed me and my siblings to learn and to get an education. Now the challenge is that they were pushing as high as they went. And so my, you know, I know how to pre-flight a car and change tires and change oil. And my mom taught me how to sew. But, you know, in our working class neighborhood, you know, we're the first generation that even aspired to go to college. And so the education meant learning the trades and learning what your parents could teach you. But for me, when it turned a point and really was what I recognize as critical and, and the significance of this day for me is that there was a community faith-based organization that came together to raise money to send a child to school. And it was a Martin Luther King Jr. scholarship that really allowed me to go to, scholarship, to, to college and paid for my four-year education. And so I know that that's for me to give back. But without that, I wouldn't be here today. So that was my turning point. Thank you. I want to move the panel to a, a, the topic of self-examination, taking ownership within our schools, within our community, within our individual lives. And I want to start with you, Derek, because uh, we heard about your tough start, dealing with those tough odds in your life. But you still found this way to take ownership of your life and turn it around. I mean, there are circumstances, those are circumstances that you know, many would say, you know, I understand if you didn't make it, but you did. How did you do that? How do we find that? Well, it starts in the beginning. My Uncle George taught me to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, when I was young. So I had never lost that. <clears throat> so therefore, when I was time to struggle, that's how I got a job, by being yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, being respectful. They gave me that opportunity. It wasn't that I did it myself. I did what, what I was taught, and I went back to what I did, what I knew. So if everyone in here knows where they come from, their strength is, they can go back and find it. But if you've never been taught that respect, you'll have to figure it out. And I had that, so when I went and tried to get a job, I smiled, I was faking like I was happy, you know, but it actually worked. You know, <laughs> you know trying to charm your way into something, and, yeah. and it actually worked. But the thing that I really wanted to pinpoint to that was, I saw success and I saw failure. Both parents failed, my uncle succeeded by working hard. It's never changed from the day he, I met him. And that's why when I finished, I started working and working, I never stopped. So for me, I think if you put that in children, even in yourself, the respect factor of who you are, you never get lost. I've never drank, never smoked, never sold, never done drugs or nothing because of that. Let me go to Gabrielle. She's homeschooled, as I mentioned, a couple of times. Gabrielle, you're, you are the epitome of taking ownership, you know, for our young people. How can you help other young people, teenagers, uh, in your same age group to, you know, maybe school's not their thing right now, but they still have to take ownership of their life? So when I got started, in the business and started doing all the different things that I was doing. Uh, I was very shy, a very shy girl and a very, uh, an introvert really. Uh, but as I got started, I kept going in the business, I started to break out of the shell and become more of an extrovert. And I really feel that the reason why I broke out of that was because what I, what I say now is I found my unique value. And unique value is basically what, which defines who you are, what you are, what you want to do in life, what your purpose is. And I feel that for a lot of kids my age and even older, that they haven't discovered their unique value. 
maybe that may be the reason why they're struggling in school and life and whatever it is. But I feel that once I found that unique value, I, I was able to um, do a lot better in school too. I mean, um, I was in school before I became homeschooled. So uh, I was definitely very shy in school as well. But once I found the unique value that I'm talking about, I, I kind of just got better in what I was doing. I felt more confident. I was just really, really I, just, I just developed, adapted to the surrounding that I was in and I started to grow. And that's what I would say to a lot of the kids my age. Finding who you are, discovering who you are, what you want to do, will definitely help you to become more confident and to really break out of that shell. Yeah, let us see. That's big, that's Gabrielle. Awesome. That's big. Okay. You better go get that. Okay. <laughs> you going to get your money now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave your money, girl. Good job. Good job. That's right. I want Lettucey to talk next. Lettucey, you were this shy, awkward young girl. Didn't really even talk in elementary school, right? You had to find, you had to take ownership at some point and self-examine. Yeah, I, music has always been my place to hide and be something, someone or someone else, something else and also writing, journaling. I want everybody to say this with me. Write it, Write it. read, it, read it. Say it, say it, say it, be it, be it. And, do it. and do it. Write it, read it, say it, be it, do it. You have to write it down so that you can see it. Write it, read it, say it. I want to be, you get it? Write it, read it, say it, be it, and then action. You need the action to do it. Whatever, y'all ain't listening to me. But <laughs> write it, read it, say it, be it, do it, saved my life. I've been saying that since I was a little kid. And I was always scared of what people would think, the, the external opinion of others. And that exhausted me all the time. I said, Mom, I can't do it. And then I'd get on stage and find a place. I would vision myself. Because I had wrote it down, I said, I want to sing, I want to be like my mom. I remember looking at her so I can see myself doing it, and then I just put the action behind it. And I never see the audience, it's about lifting. I use my gift to lift, not for things. I pray for those things and hope they'll come, but I use my gift to lift. I don't use it to compete with others, I do my best and leave it at that. That's all I can do. But there was a moment, I just want to get this out. I wrote a book called Better Than All Right. And I, that shy stuff and being awkward, I had to write it with Essence Magazine and I wrote my whole life in this book, like my journals. And that's why I'm telling you to write it. And I, I, they said, can you put all these pictures that you took and all these things that inspire you, just make a whole collage of your life. And this book brought my family together. It got us talking about old things just because I had written something and wrote it down and wrote all the stories of being the action that I always wanted to be, that let us see singer, and how someone else, sometimes it takes others to lift you too, because you can't see yourself. And when you're around good people, there's always this thing I say, be careful of who and what you are around, who you allow in your personal circle. <laughs> sometimes you can't let everyone in. You can give the, you see glimpses of who I am, but who I really care about is in that real core circle. And you have to guard that with your life. So it's leap out on faith and trust and know that he will provide for you if you have faith. Love yourself by any means necessary. And be careful of who and what you allow in your personal circle. I said every show. And, and writing that down and reading it, having affirmations around you, 
Every day having a routine will help you. People get out of routines and don't take care of themselves first. How are you going to save others when you can't save yourself? Hezekiah, I want to go back to those failing grades because, I don't know, maybe you had bad teachers or maybe some circumstance in your life at that time caused that to happen, whatever it was. I want you to dig deeper for us and share a little bit about how you dug your way out of that. Well, I, I don't know that it was a, a result of my inaction. I had transferred schools. I was the only black kid in the school that I went to. And my teacher was not used to teaching young people like me. And so uh, it was quite different. Uh, what I know is that the history and the facts are that when I went down south, I got skipped two levels. And so uh, there must be something indifferent about the quality of education that I was exposed to. I, I, I take this day very seriously. You know, I've been in business for 18 years. I'm 25. Um, I'm getting old. And my body is getting weary. But I have been giving MLK speeches for the last 12 years. I uh, just got back recently from Nova Scotia and in Romania where they were exposed for the first time to a lot of the principles and teachings of Dr. King. And to bring your question to more substance in this conversation, uh, a few years ago I was in Westchester County, which is one of the wealthiest counties in New York and in the country. And a young man came up to me and said to me, thank you for your speech. I really learned a lot about Dr. King, but I always knew that he was the reason why I dreamed at night. And I walked by from him, and then I said to myself, that didn't sound right. This young man came up to me and said, the reason why we have dreams, visual dreams at night, is because of Dr. King. Now, he has a misinterpretation of what Dr. King meant by dreaming, right? And so a lot of us are commercialized. We think that uh, Dr. King, all, all he did was dream. But you, it takes a lot of fortitude to walk down a street knowing that every second you got breathing could be your last second. That's not dreaming. That's action. That's, that's provoking leadership. That's servant leadership. One of my favorite speeches by Dr. King is the John Major Instinct speech when he says, if you want to be important, wonderful, recognize, wonderful, great, wonderful, but recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And he describes that as a new definition of greatness. And in order to be great, we all must serve. Our subjects and verbs don't have to agree to serve. We don't have to know Plato and Aristotle to serve. We don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. We only need a heart full of grace, soul generated by love. And all of us can be that servant. And so if we don't teach the people if we don't lead by example, then what you have is communities where young people think that Dr. King was a dreamer and other people think that people like me don't have the potential to sit on this stage right now and be who I am that I am today. Yeah. Right, I wake up every morning because I want to wake up. I go to work because I want to go to work. I drive the car I want to drive. I am somebody because somebody prayed for me yeah. and had me on their mind. I serve a God who will do anything for anybody. Put food on the table when you're hungry. Thirsty, give you something to drink. Naked, clothe you. That's the kind of thing we need to teach our young people. That's the kind of mentality we need to have. That's what Dr. King was all about. And that's why I am who I am. All right. Okay, Gwen, I keep asking you to follow Hezekiah once again. <laughs> I thought we were mixing it up. I thought you were going to pick on it. <laughs> My goodness. But, I, but so, you know, um, you're, what so, I want you to pinpoint on, too, Gwen, is you, we have a lot of women in our community who are going to work, who are making the money, who are the head mm -hmm. of their households, who have great jobs. Mm -hmm. 
But women are not supposed to know about money and how to invest it and how to finance it. We're not supposed to know these things, Gwen. Something inside of you from that humble beginning you talked about with your parents got you to this point. And in, what in your mind clicked to tell yourself that you can be an African-American woman making things happen the way you do in corporate America? Well, for me, um, you know, I mentioned to you that um, the community sent me to school, which I'm so grateful for. And, and just with that launching point, I was destined to always give back, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. But when I got to school, so, so I graduated from a public school system, very strong student, straight A's, I struggled. So I went to a private university, and the people that went to school with me came from private school backgrounds, different you know, educational uh, starting points, so they were better prepared than I was in school. And so I went to school with this scholarship, and I actually got to a point where I was in danger of losing my scholarship because I actually struggled to stay in school. And so, um, so one of the turning points in school for me was really the network. And I think this is kind of the value that we have of our community. And I'll tell you the value that I've had as I've moved through corporate America, where, you know, once I reached out and asked for help, you know, there was a network of people who came in with resources, with tutoring, with access to things. I had no idea, you know, different studying techniques. And um, that's really how I was successful in moving out of college. And then as I started to just look around, you know, because I don't think that I was not as smart, but I think that I just didn't have access to the same resources. And I actually did not have the education to know how to tap into the resources. And so as I, I, I graduated with a degree in finance and I decided I wanted to be in a role where I control the money, you know, because I'm looking around and when I go to the banks, I want to understand how to control the money. And I'm thinking, I'm as smart as that person. What do they have access to in terms of resources that I don't have access to because of where I live, or because of who my parents are? And so um, the turning point for me was definitely that. But also, you know, we, we just kind of have a strong legacy of faith. and um, and. Everywhere I went as I walk, went through corporate America, I can relate to the story of being the only black. And so I'm in, in, in organ, many organizations as the only black person at a senior level. But there was still a network of people who came to give me support. And it might have come in the way of somebody from the mailroom or somebody who was an administrative assistant. I mean, we are everywhere. We're in the fiber. And we, And we come, we come together to give each other that support, and that's what I'm grateful for. That was the turning point for me in terms of taking the ownership of the things that I can do, but also just to get back to the faith. You know, the scripture that I hold in my heart always is, I can do all things through Christ mm -hmm. who strengthens me. Danella, can you speak to how you experienced being an exceptional student in sort of an imperfect school environment growing up? Uh, because we have an issue of apathy and this attitude about learning that we've got to turn around in our kids. And for me, I can speak on our level, local level. I started out in Southeast DC, went to Montgomery County, and at that time, my teacher, without testing me, put me in two reading levels behind, without even testing me. We saw in your case, you know, you went up when you went to the to Southern. And so for me, it was always just seeing, I was very blessed to know inside myself that I had the ability to change my world. And the reason I had that is because we moved so often. We moved starting out because my mother wanted us to feel safe. And being renters, fellow renters, you know this, the rent gets too high, then you have to move again. So we were always either moving to make sure we live someplace safe or a place we could afford. And what I noticed is people who had happiness and joy regardless of their circumstance. So I could be in a Montgomery County school and see parents that are miserable and be in a Southeast school and see parents who have love and God in their heart. And for me, starting out in school, 
being two reading levels behind without even being tested and then graduating high school in English honors, I knew for myself, no matter what my world was around me, that I had the ability to change it if I believed and worked hard consistently. And now I want to move the discussion towards addressing that achievement gap that I talked about at the beginning of the program. Dr. King said, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Gabrielle, do, how, how do you deal with being so exceptional? Uh, in an environment where other kids might see you or view you as a nerd or not cool. I know you're being homeschooled, but you still are around other teens and you still encounter them. Uh, one of the reasons why some of our kids don't want to excel is because they think learning is not cool. How do you address that? Well, um, as I said, I, though I'm a homeschooled, I've been in regular school basically all of my life. I just got started homeschool this year. So I have been in that environment with kids that um, they don't really feel like learning, they don't feel like studying, they don't see how it will apply um, to future. I don't, I, of course, I mean, being blessed with growing up in such a wonderful family that has taught me this, I, I just didn't, I don't really understand how they don't under, uh, see how education will help them in the future. Um, but for those that don't, that feel that because I, I study, because I learn, because I've been doing things that adults usually do, they, I, I'm always around those, I mean, I was around those a lot of people very often. Um, I know I, in my book, I call them dream killers. Um, <laughs> basically, yeah. <laughs> And I say, I say it, um, they're people that, of course, they kind of, they try and kill your dreams. And it's not just because, oh, they don't really believe that you'll achieve it. It's because they believe you will achieve it. And... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I understand that. I've grown to understand that when people, when the kids in school, um, they told me before, I know a couple times, uh, they were like, oh, your jewelry is made of plastic from the dollar store and um, so crazy things that they just come, came up with. I learned to just ignore it. And my friends, they're trying to look out with, for me and they tell me this and that. And I'm like, don't tell me that. I don't really need to hear what they told, told said about me. It's not helping me in any way. Yeah. But, but what I do want to do is when there are people that are like that, I don't want to ignore them because they're just going to go ahead and do it to another person and another person. I want to tell them or at least I want to share with them, not saying it to them, oh, you're doing something wrong, you shouldn't be talking to me like this, but talk to them about how this can affect other people, how this can make other people feel. And that even though it doesn't affect me, I think it's affecting you inside as well. Because obviously there's some issue inside. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Here, you got more money, Gabrielle. <laughs> Go and get your money, girl. Thirteen, almost fourteen. There you have it. Derek, I want you and Hezekiah to address the issue and the challenge today with our boys. Uh, there are statistics that tell us that our boys are in trouble, but we don't need to look at those numbers. We, we see what is happening in many of our communities. And so I want to have you start. I mean, you got a degree in chemistry, right? Pharmacy. So, <laughs> okay, hold on. Okay, yeah. Just get all your money, girl. This is a moment. 
That's how you solve it. And yeah. I'm speechless. But yeah, we, we, we have to focus on what we need to do for our boys. And you can speak to that. You got four of them yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you have yeah, as raised, children. Yes. yes. Uh, the difference with me is what I see in society now is I will not allow my son to know a rap verse before he knows a Bible verse. Uh. <laughs> Amen. Hey, hey. <laughs> Go on and get your money, Derek. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> But what happened was society had allowed people to think success was financial, like sports. I told them, don't applaud me. Applaud me the teacher who taught me how to read and write. Go applaud the neighbor who told me to be respectful in my neighborhood, to keep a clean neighborhood. We've lost so much focus on what we teach our children. And it starts at home. People say, oh, all this and that. I say, well, take a parent and take them to school who's got to deal with everybody else's kids. You'll see what that kid acts like. And it's a very simple tool that we've had from the day of time for everyone was the respect that you give to that person. They'll have it inside them. Because you know people stray away. But you always come back to what you know best. And respect is the key. So for me, raising my boys were basically just to be a man and you respect everyone. And the fact that you have respect for yourself, it gives that. Because you realize rap is the only music that you die from. You wonder why it's in all culture. Mm -hmm. And society has portrayed it to where, hey, let's give them a million dollars and they don't even educate themselves. And the funny story is, my first check that I ever had was $250,000. I've never, because I've always worked cash on hand. And I called my attorney and I asked him, I said, well, I looked at half of it was gone, it was 127. I called the attorney, I said, who is FICA? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and because I wasn't educated in financial literacy, I didn't really know. I was 21, I got that money, and I was just like, oh man, I'm excited. I go, my first 20,000, I started a foundation. My next 20, I put in retirement, and then I bought a car. But financial literacy is what I learned. Now I do my tax, I can do all these things, but coming from my background, I wasn't supposed to do that. I wasn't supposed to graduate with a pharmacy degree, with a major, in, uh, a minor in social work. I wasn't supposed to do that. And and the reason, only reason I wrote that book was 20 years later, I went and found my mother, picked up in the alley, cleaned her up, and we had Christmas dinner for the first time in 20 years. <laughs> but I learned all of that from a man called Uncle, my Uncle George. Another man took another man's child, and the only, nothing against you women, because I love my women, but to get a man to understand how to be a man quicker, he needs a man to teach him that. A mother to love him, but a man to teach him. <laughs> and Hezekiah, I want you to, to follow up, because we do have a crisis with our boys in their thinking, in their thinking. Uh, and we've got to really find a way to save them. Man, step up. Well, the last five days have been very interesting for me. I've slept all but six of them. Uh, I've only had six hours of sleep, let me rephrase that. This weekend, uh, as I do every now and again, I hosted a leadership retreat for young high school and college males and females. I have uh, programs that I run all year round. We have over 4,000 kids in our programs. And so I have a unique perspective, a front hand door, on a lot of the issues facing young black males. Number one, because I am one. And number two, because I have so many of my uh, young people who are sons to me, who I have to ensure that they succeed. Uh, 
Last night we had a spiritual awakening and for the first time in their lives probably uh, those young men cried in front of other young men. Uh, and then probably for the first time in their lives they got a hug from a man who they could look to uh, and follow appropriate actions by, you see. You see, a lot of folks when they read my bio, I, 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 they, they think that I'm going to come and talk about money, right, or I'm going to talk about business, but I don't sell anything. I don't have anything to sell but myself, and I've already sold myself to God, and so I don't need to sell it to anybody else. But when I say that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, I really mean that. And so I dedicate a lot of my life to servicing others. Now the problem with young black men is because the, the ones that they have in their lives are horrible examples and the ones that think they ought to be in their lives shouldn't be there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to say something, y'all got to forgive me, I might be out of order. Uh, don't encourage me. I, I, <laughs> I told you I'm not a preacher but do not push me. Uh, Reverend Jenkins, that's a, that's a rap verse. It works, you just got to turn it around. Turn it in God's favor. What drives me nuts is how so many people are critical about young African-American males, about, in particular about them wearing their pants down below their the belt. I want you to know I don't wear my pants. I buy belts and I pay good money for them and I use them. I use everything I pay for. Uh, I don't drink. I've never drank in my life. I don't smoke. Never smoked in my life. I, I have a very good life. Uh, but what drives me nuts is how so many people get angry about young black men walking around with their pants hanging off their behind. But so many of those folks who are criticizing those young people are the same people who have their pants hanging down. The only difference is that their, their pants are, are being weighted down because of the weight of illicit goods, power, and money they've received from pimping out the kids in the first place. How are you going to tell a young man to have character and respect when you're going around fornicating and having children out of wedlock and you think all of a something you got the expertise, the power, and the wisdom to tell a young man to pull his pants up. Sit down and shut up. You done lost your mind. That ain't holy, that ain't righteous, and that's not in the place of God. You can't teach young people what you're not doing yourself. These young men ain't stupid. Nobody likes a hypocrite. And too often, too many of us in our power and to titular roles lose sight of our responsibility to ourselves and by default to other people. And so the problem with young black men is that there are not enough young black men who have positive examples who lead every day in every way by example. And until we as men, black men, and, and, and he's absolutely right, uh, too often we leave uh, women to raise a man, and that's why they don't understand the responsibilities of manhood when they get older. But it's our responsibility as black men to raise these young black men in an environment where they can look at you and exemplify and amplify the same character and characteristics that they see in you. And if they can't look at you and reflect back on their lives a positive role and a positive attitude, then there's something wrong with you. It ain't something wrong with the kid. And so, I mean, I'm going to stop there. Okay. <laughs> well said. I'm sorry, just to add on to that real quick. Oh, yeah, just, and, and while you're doing that, I want to ask folks in the audience if you have a question. The microphones are set up. Come down. Make sure you know your question and make sure it's concise. We, we, we can't be here all day. It was just to say that, there, you, that all men in here can help raise another, another per, you know, the young man. Yeah. Just a common courtesy of speaking to him gives him uplifting words. If you just walk past a guy and says, hey, young man, pull your pants up. Let's have a conversation. How can I help? Yeah. That can change a little boy, a child's mind just that quick. Yeah. Instead of being confrontational, combative. We're talking about addressing the achievement gap. And as people come forward with their questions, Danella, I just want to say one word. Fractions. You have a story. <laughs> okay, so here's my
my fraction story. So like I said, I went from Southeast DC to Montgomery County. I've also been in school in Prince George's County as well. In total, four elementaries, two middle schools, two high schools. And the fraction story is when I went to Montgomery County School, they had already learned fractions. When I was in DC schools, the last day of second grade, the teacher said, this is what you'll learn next year. And so that was fractions. When I got to Montgomery County, the teacher said, oh, no, we're done with that. We're on calculators. Now I'm going to teach you how to do your division on a calculator. And what I told Millette, the struggle for me always was, at that time, to catch up regardless of where I was placed. And so unfortunately, there is a disparity in our school system. And we know that. But I encourage you all to look within yourself to see how you can help someone, encourage someone to fight beyond their circumstance, to fight beyond what the world is saying, this is where you need to be, this is where you are, to encourage them to know that they have the power and they have God in them that can lead them to change their life. Thank you. And one other thing, <laughs> I'm in communications because that fraction, fractions are tough. Fractions are tough. <laughs> Lettucey, do you want to add to this discussion? We're no, I think it's beautiful. I just wanted to applaud the women that are raising men. Um, it, it's hard. And to those of you that have uh, no examples, I've always looked at others. Who do I want to be like? Or, or you know, thank God, again, this, this whole panel, it still starts at home. It's still about networking in the community, grabbing someone and holding them and lifting them. It's still about giving back. I, I hear it over and over again in each of us. It starts at home. So you, we just have to find the necessary tools to make ourselves empowered and make that time to do it. Before we go to the audience, uh, Gwen. Speak to the girls and young women about fear, about taking ownership of their money, learning about money, and uh, not being afraid in a society dominated by men who might tell us that you should not know how to be good with your money. So, um, so you just gave me my, my pulpit, that is my life. Um, I raised two daughters as a single parent. I now have a grandson, so I appreciate the comments about raising men and, and recognize that a woman can't raise a man. So I appreciate that, that, that input. But, um, but one of the things my daughters tease me about is because I've been in risk management, but I teach credit risk, and so I know a lot about credit. And they tease me because they say, it doesn't matter what your topic is, when you're on a panel, you always manage to weave in financial literacy. So that's what I want to weave in now, because um, that is an area that, um, you know, as, as black people, we need to pay more attention to. Um, obviously, you know, we're in a financial crisis, and, and the inequity and the disparity between blacks and whites is real, you know, so the income, there's an income gap, there's a wealth gap, there's a housing gap, and so that's all real. But we also are the biggest consumers. We are the ones that have higher spending in proportion to our income. And we are also ones that tend to have worse credit, you know, because we don't pay enough attention to our credit. And so what I wanted to say today is to encourage everybody to learn as much as possible about your finances. Be responsible. You know, it's, it's in the word, you know, tithe and be responsible with the gifts that God has given us. Um, check your credit every year. You know, there is a free source for checking your credit report so that you can keep track of your credit, annualcreditreport.com. And I have a phone number for anybody who doesn't have access to the internet. I'm happy to share that with you. But really, um, one of the ways that we continue to be held down and the ways that um, sometimes we're just, we don't have the access to the same opportunities because of the shackles around finances and the fact that uh, in some cases we just kind of are not being as responsible and not being as careful. And so my message to, you know, young women, um, but of course to all of us, you know, is really learn as much as you can about education. And just another plug around housing, you know, because that's, that's the business that I'm in. Um, we're in a housing crisis. 
And the sad thing about the crisis is that still, when people get into trouble with their mortgages, most people don't call their servicer to ask for what help is available to them. And there's a lot of help out there that's available. So I really want to just speak to people today to, to make sure you know that make those phone calls, ask for help, because there is help available. But unfortunately, many people just leave without asking for help because of the perception that there is no help. And obviously, all of the things that come with struggling, you know, shame yeah. and, and, you know, just discouragement. So, so there, there's help out there. Reach out and get it. Thank you. Thank you. I want to now go to our audience with questions. Uh, over here first. Hi there, what's your name? Uh, yes, my name is Monica Jones, and I am a member of First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. And I, my question is for the young um, males. It's about young males because I'm ra um, a single mom raising um, a young man, and actually I've taken in uh, one of his good friends. Um, you know, to, to share love with him as well. But what I'm finding, the, the young men are staying focused. They're, in, they're trying to do the best that they can. They, my son does know the Bible before he learned um, the rap. And, but he's at age 20 now, and I'm finding that the young men around him are being, that he's went to co uh, school with and are, dying, being shot. Um, he's going through this struggle now. And I want to know how you address that with the young men, that, the two young men that I'm working with. They, they find that the guys that are around them in situations where they're being killed, shot down, going to jail. I think, I think Derek probably can start with that. So how can I how can help, we help her? these two young men in my life? to deal with that because my son is in college but he's but he's still he's around changed. those he's is changed. he still around those guys who are not so no he's changed because okay. of this okay he, he's changed because of it because he is focused is trying to better his life is t he does read the bible um, okay i think Derek can i think Derek can help you okay. african american women are the strongest women i've ever met They've, and I'll give you the reason. They've had to deal with their men being hung, in prison, beaten, coming home from jobs, stressed, wanting to get physical pleasure, and then raising that man's child. That's who want to clear that first. Those are the strongest woman genes that you have. So you're able to do whatever you want to help that young man. But the second point is, he becomes what he thinks about the most. So what you're putting him around is what he thinks about the most. So if you take them out of that environment anywhere else, he'll think about that. If he sits in with his brother and I, he'll think about what we're doing to try to be successful. If he wants to be a radio host, you know, whatever he wants to do, you have to put him in an environment to make his mind think that. That's why young men are getting lost, because they think about what they see the most. So therefore, it's not just that environment. You know, my father's best friend of 29 years stabbed and killed my sister, father's best friend. But you can't determine it because he was in that environment, drug infested. Take him out of that. I don't care what you have to do, if it's coaching, preaching, take him out of that and you'll see results. You won't have to wonder where he's at, you'll see results. Excellent. Next question. Yes, um, I'd like to um, bring readings from Australia United Methodist Church, Reverend Dr. Uh, Timothy, um, I'd like to say that I can identify with everybody up on that stage. Let us see, the same type of dysfunctional family, uh, young lady, I'm a real estate agent, young man, I have a nephew that uh, had a child, a father to child of 14, he is now um, 40. His son, he's an electrical engineer with a PE. His son is a mechanical engineer working for Grumman. Young lady, I had a Martin Luther King scholarship from Iona College. I graduated in 1973. Yes, I am the proud 
niece of Septima Point said Clark, who's on the cover of I Dream a World, an educator, and I am an educator. And I think that what we should do instead of PTA Association, Parent Teacher Association, push toward advancement. I like working with children, young men, and trying to let them know what is out there for them because we blame each other as parents, teachers, and administrators. Okay. What we should do, when you see a mother that's working two jobs to raise her children, don't point fingers and say she's not home. She's trying to feed her children. And that's what happens in the school system. I see it all the time. My aunt, back in 1973 when okay. I was teaching, would say, let's keep babies. Here we are right now with let's keep babies. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. We got to keep the comments short. We, we have to. I, um, I do have a question from the audience. Uh, this person is, uh, uh, wrote it down. And I'll just read all of it. I have a, this person has a question about education. This person is speech impaired, um, but has four academic degrees, including a PhD in education from very well, a well-respected university. However, is bagging groceries right now for a living because of the constant discrimination uh, uh, facing this person from uh, the disability. I don't know if this is a man or a woman. What advice do you have for someone who is feeling so discouraged? Hezekiah? Joy cometh early in the morning. Certainly you have to uh, continue to push yourself. I, I, I've hired uh, over 4,000 people in my life and I probably fired over 6,000 people. I, in my life, you don't, uh, your education does not dictate whether you are supposed to get anything. We achieve in life not because of what we have, but in spite of what we don't have. And so you can have a PhD come in my office and say you want to do X, Y, and Z, don't mean you're going to get hired. The PhD has to be supplemented with skill sets that help me advance the cause of what I'm trying to do. And so what I would suggest to anybody who is struggling to find their purpose, which is ultimately the question, yeah. is to re-examine and think about what truly is your purpose and if what you're going after connects to your purpose. All right. I'm going to go over here. Nice and brief. Your question or comment? Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Elizabeth. I go to Mount Enon Baptist Church. Um, my question to the panel is, do you feel as if, um, what, what do you feel as if has been, I guess, the um, more dam damaging to our society as a whole, the separation of church and state, or um, I guess uh, parents or our community striving toward, um, I guess, uh, money and furthering their careers. Um, because I, as well as the rest of you, know that uh, churches, uh, churches founded most of the HBCUs. And ever since there was a separation of church and state, there seems as if, you know, okay. there's been a lot of issues. So which one do you feel has been more damaging to our society? Anybody want to take that lettuce? Would you? Okay. <laughs> Gwen. So thank you. And um, so, so that's a great question. And it's hard to say what is most damaging. Mm -hmm. but, but there's no doubt about it that, um, you know, this country was founded on faith, right? In God we trust. And so the removal of God and worship, formal worship in the education system has made a big difference. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's taken the foundation of, of what held us as a country, but, it, but it's been the foundation of us as a, a family and a community. But I also do want to talk about um, community. And, and I think, you know, one of the other things that, that has, I know helped me, you know, um, what, it, it's kind of a, it takes a village. Everybody's heard that proverb. And it's true, you know, and so it's not really new having, you know, 
both parents working. It's not new having single parents if you go back to the roots of slavery where you had families that were ripped apart. But the difference is that families pulled together. You know, we helped each other out. We disciplined each other's children. You know, we did what it takes to make sure that we, um, we kind of instilled a set of values and we worked together as a community to make sure that the kids stayed in line, yes, but that we helped each other to be successful. And, and I think that's something that all is missing um, that we need to get back to, you know, in terms of strengthening ourselves as a community. I think I want to add to that. I think now is a different time than our elders. And we, sometimes we can get caught up in thinking that the old way is the best way instead of learning what's going on now and figuring out what this generation is going through and then trying to adapt the old and the new together. Mm -hmm. We don't do that enough. I think that's damaging because everyone is thinking this generation had the same issues as the elders and it's not true. It's, there's still the same problems but it's probably even harder because we have television and immediate things coming at them so quickly, more so than the elders. And I think the, the old school, we gotta, you have to find a way to understand, sit with the, the children now and figure out what's really going on with them. It's not as basic as we think. All right. Okay, we're running, we're running tight on time. I, I need to try to squeeze in uh, a couple of more questions. Let me, let me go to you. Good morning, family. I know we have a problem in the schools with the way they are educating our young black men. They want to give them medication to slow them down. And when I look at that, I don't see it as they need to slow us down, but they need to step it up. Right. So that way, that young man that can hit the streets and count how much money he's making, count how much product he has and watch for the police and watch for that other person that's about to jack him. Mm -hmm. He's multitasking a lot. How can we help him to get more focused on what's positive? Because we already know he's got it in him. How can we get together? Because we can't change the schools because that's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. But we need to do something then when we wake up in the morning, we can start on to help our young black men that don't need that medication, that's being given that medication unnecessarily. All right. Help me, help my son. How Anybody want to address how you, that? How would you reach them? Because the simple format is, like you just said, the street guys have to start from the bottom, work their way up top. And same way at McDonald's, you start the cashier, you become the manager, you become the owner, you become a franchisee. Same situation as a street guy. But how do you get attention to them is the key. And I think what us, we need to start doing now is teaching them respect values first. You say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, pull your pants up, come in with a shirt just tucked in, it could be whatever it is, and you teach them how to prepare to get a job. Not none of that kids now are texting, you know, misspelled words and they're thinking it's the right way when they do it on the application for a job interview. So to get those young men, we have to grab them before they go to the, all of that. And the only way you do that is from the respect factor. So you, my brother, find that young man.